well, gee, if I'm audible, how come I'm, I'm not making huge amounts of money through unethical business practices with the selling of audiobooks, huh? All right, well, um, I'm just going to get started and... Uh... Oh, yeah, no, Audible has super unethical business practices. I mean, it's an Amazon company, so what do you expect? Mm -hmm. Let's ignore the fact that Twitch is an, is an Amazon company. <laughs> just because there's no ethical consumption under late capitalism does not mean I can't also be a hypocrite. All right. Let's get started. So, um, this is a wall that people love to write illusory wall ahead in front of. Um, which means that you get tons of liar ahead messages around here. It's not. It's just, it just looks like the kind of thing that's an illusory wall. But there are only about four or five illusory walls in the entire game, and like three of them are in one of the expansion packs. Hello, Jules. So, um, it is one of those interesting mechanics that they, they like to put in. FromSoft really enjoy to put tiny mechanics in games that only show up once or twice and aren't massively widespread. Okay. Cannot remember for the life of me how far I got through this uh, section last time because um, it was a few days ago and I've completed the entire game on my other save since then. I have, in fact... Beaten... I 100%ed it earlier today. I successfully beat the toughest boss in the game, which is the DLC boss, Manus, Father of the Abyss. And uh, then just went and tidied up the last couple bonus bosses, and um, yeah, I beat him on my first try, which wasn't difficult. There's actually only a handful of illusory walls in Dark Souls 3 as well. There's, um, I think there's more than in Dark Souls 1, but in all of the games there's a few illusory walls, but not enough that um, you can ever really get a consistent... Like, if you see this kind of area, there will probably be an illusory wall thing going. Although, um, I think there's a wider variety of illusory things. There's more things that aren't walls. Do I, did I bother to equip my... yeah, there we go. I definitely should have picked up some more of these before we got um, to this area, because it is liable to get you poisoned if you aren't paying attention, which is what I'll be doing, because I'm talking. I wonder if I have anything that can boost my magical damage output slightly, because it's irritating to hit these things and almost kill them, but not quite. So, there are a few items in the game that boost your damage output, but they're probably not going to show up for quite a while. Um, the Bellowing Dragon Crest Ring is 20,000 souls, and the... Uh, what's the other one? Uh, the Dusk Crown... Actually, we could probably get that soon-ish, if we wanted to do a long and tedious fight with a uh, large Hydra that happens to be squatting in front of the access to the DLC. Which is also in this sort of odd from softy way there's lots of there's absolutely no interest on the, on behalf of the designer to um have kind of obvious systems for accessing different things in the game world um the dlc is like a five-step process that requires you to go back to a place you don't really have any reason to go to in the first place um You guys will just combo you to death. Uh, and um, it's kind of it applies that ethos to everything. Is, is there? No, these are just empty crates. Also, I don't believe there are any. Actually, no, that's not true. There is one crate in the game that has an item in it, but it's just that there's a guy behind it <laughs> who has an item. Um, FromSoft love to have these incredibly detailed breakable objects in all of their games. There's a there's a scroll case in Dark Souls 3 that breaks into about 400 distinct poly... Uh, not 400 polygons. 400 distinct items, each of which is really elaborately detailed. Um, I should have been wearing these all along, actually. I would like to switch to a faster weapon at some point, but I should probably also switch to the spider shield while we're down here. Yeah, the Undead Asylum is really more of a secret bonus area, so it makes sense that it's, like, 
hard to find and it's actually a lot more straightforward than most places um, oh god I've equipped that <laughs> I've decided to go for confused turtle style um, which is an incredibly difficult combat style which involves uh, wearing shields on both arms this is a disaster so I've been very ill for a couple of days um, which may explain my uh, incredibly skillful combat style today I spent half the day in bed and uh, kind of losing my mind a little bit I get these horrible flare-ups post-covid Dual shields is actually a viable uh, combat style in um, Dark Souls 3. There are because Dark Souls 3 has shield bashes for for more weapons, and um, the shield bat. I've had enough of these fucking rats. I'll tell you what. Uh, the shield bash of some of them is quite effective, and there's actually two sides of a door that you can equip one in each arm and just form an impenetrable barrier, which is fun. There's a lot of fun in FromSoft, I think. They make, like to make these incredibly grim, miserable worlds. Oh, is the paired shield in um, Dark Souls 2? I thought it was 3. Maybe it's in both. Of course, the real, um, the real pro strat is to get two skeleton wheels and dual wield those. Truly become the motorcycle. So, these passageways are all tangled and complicated. Do I have... It might might be worth going and just buying a ton of moss. Um, but then it'll be difficult to... No, it won't, because I can just homeward bone back down here. Learning to manipulate the homeward bone teleportation ability is um, one of the neat tricks that makes life so much easier. Oh, those guys. No, in Dark Souls 3 there's just an actual, like, door. Door? Like it's a door. Oh, I remember we came through this backwards because I dropped, I took the drop down from the big rat. So actually this route we have not seen yet. This is one of the traditional nasty Dark Souls trip track. Uh, trip track? Trip. Trick. Trap. Hallways. So there's, um... Just an absolute shitload of slimes on the ceiling. If you walk through here, they will drop on you and kill you. They're also really difficult to actually kill. Well, I say difficult. They're very easy to kill, but they're time-consuming to kill. Because um, they basically just have huge hit points and resistances, and uh, they're actually quite hard to hit with a lot of weapons, even. Elation ahead. <laughs> It's fascinating that they decided to install a toilet in the sewer. Perhaps this place wasn't intended as a sewer originally, and it's become that over time. Also, this is the first time you actually meet a slime. As you can see, it's up there. It is difficult to, to uh, kind of not get that happen to you. The trick is to dodge roll through its like target zone, but um, yeah. I'll admit I've been slightly spoiled by the fact that I've just been playing my incredibly high level character all day, so I'm used to just I'm used to just brushing things off and, and killing everything in one hit with my amazing spell power. If you run through here in a zigzag, they don't drop on you. Um, they do drop, but they can't hit you properly. So that's the trick for that. Um, they can actually land on you if you sprint through at, in just a straight line, if you pass right underneath them. Okay. Oh, no, okay. It's not even what, it's like a, it's like a soul of a lost undead or something. It's, it's basically a worthless treasure, and yet, and yet. I think I read something the other day that was quite a good um, kind of encapsulation of why Dark Souls is the way it is, and it's that it came out at a time when there was a certain assumption that um, the player and the game designer were sort of working in concert. The game designer would, um, you know, lead you towards your goals and make things 
achievable and so on. I actually I actually disagree with this take to some extent. Um, because one of the interesting things about Dark Souls is that, yes, it does... There is an oppositional component between you and the designer. However, once you learn what Dark Souls wants from you, it's much less of an issue. It's about learning how to play the game to, you know, face its challenge. And um, expecting things to be handed to you doesn't doesn't fit into that. But um, I think the, the point the person was making was that um, it's impossible to have the original Dark Souls experience now because everyone knows Dark Souls is the tough game that is unfair to you. Although, as I always point out, it is not an unfair game, it is just uh, a merciless game. What is a quarter of 52? I hate that this make game makes you do arithmetic while you're trying to figure... While, while you're trying to dodge roll. Um, God, okay, so a quarter of 50 is 12.5. And a quarter of 2 is 0.5. So I can go up to 13 equipment loads. So I can, in fact, wear the sack on my head. Um, which is the single most important thing to do in any game that gives you the option. You alright, buddy? Thank you. I would have been suffering with it. Feeling it in the line. Thank you. Thank you dearly. I am Luis Gibbs. What a great spot. So this guy is the second spellcasting trainer, or the third, actually, if you count miracles, which you shouldn't, because that's not wizard shit. Uh, oh, hello, then. I'm fine, thanks to you. So he just, that's all he says, he'll just, he'll just make his own way out, but um, Laurentius teaches pyromancy, which uh, in Dark Souls 1 does not require any stat scaling, which means that um, provided you invest souls in upgrading your, like, casting apparatus, you can... Um, be as powerful of a pyromancer as anyone else without having to, you know, specialise your stat spread. Games were being, like, games as a, as an art form were being referred to as being casualised a lot at that time, but it's not entirely true. There were plenty of challenge, you know, challenging and challenge-based games at the time. Um, it was almost kind of a moral panic in, in, like, gamers, which never ends well for anyone. Um, but like all moral panics, it was kind of baseless, um, especially considering Demon's Souls itself came out a few years prior, um, and was, you know, just as, just as challenging, very much had that Miyazaki Dark Souls challenge ethos. Um, I hate the waterlog bits. There are, um, there is a very useful item. Someone mentioned earlier the, uh, opportunity in the game to revisit the Undead Asylum, and um, revisiting the Undead Asylum gets you a very useful item that allows you to move at full speed through water no matter what. Um, one of the things I really enjoy about uh, Dark Souls is that it does have these slightly... these, these very specific magic items um, that are that are almost more like the kind of magic items you might hear about in, in folklore. It's not, you know... This gives you plus five to your hit points stat. It's um, no, this this uh, has a is a magic ring that lets you move through water without it impeding you. Isn't that useful? And it actually is incredibly useful in certain parts of the game. I mean, yeah, I haven't had the chance to play Demon Souls, but I have heard that it is more challenging. They sort of refined the formula a bit with uh, Dark Souls. So this is. Uh, where we came in. Since I've fought my way back up here, I might as well go buy some moss, but um, I did have good reason to do this, considering we skipped those two tunnel sections by using the giant rot rat drop-down. Which would be a really good name for a bar, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I haven't played Dark Souls 2 since the first time I played it. I only completed that one once. But um, I do think Dark Souls 1 is more difficult than Dark Souls 3, based on the fact that I completed Dark Souls 3 again a month or so ago. Um, 
Although, saying that, playing as Sorcerer in Dark Souls 1 is um, easier than playing not Sorcerer in Dark Souls 3. Sorcerer really is easy mode. I beat... On my, on my other save, where I don't have to worry about uh, talking at the same time as playing, I did, in fact, beat almost all of the bosses first try. I beat the toughest boss in the game first try, and it's all just... Because the Sorcerer is incredibly overpowered if you build it right. Hi, Bina. Um... The thing about uh, being a sorcerer, though, is that it is it is easy mode <laughs> for PvE. However, I think that uh, being a sorcerer is generally pretty underpowered in PvP. This is based on the fact that I tend to kill enemy sorcerers if they invade me, and... Well, I never invade anyone, but I imagine that if I invaded someone, I would uh, fail. And um, that basically comes down to the fact that dodge rolling is so effective. I haven't got to play Bloodborne either. I haven't played Demon's Souls because I don't have a PS3. I haven't played Bloodborne because I don't have a PS4. Um, I have played Sekiro. I do think that that is the best of the, the modern FromSoft games. Although I don't think it's a, 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 a Soulsborne game. I think that it is... Um, I think it is the same design ethos applied to a different gaming genre and a different narrative genre. Because games are kind of divided between um, what they are mechanically and what they are narratively. Uh, I should probably- I wonder if I should have gone back to Firelink and talked to Laurentius. I'm not going to take Pyromancy because there's not much point as a sorcerer. Um, you need your attunement slots for sorceries. There's no point um, spending your attunement slots on um, pyromancy spells if you are also putting intelligence in being a sorcerer. But um, yeah, so Sekiro is kind of... Um, I think that the ultimate intention behind Dark Souls was to take a... Um, a certain set of design goals, this kind of like difficulty and inscrutability, and a certain set of narrative goals with this sort of complexity and um, ambiguity, and to sort of apply those onto pre-existing genres. And so Dark Souls is a Western RPG through a Japanese lens, which I think is really interesting. It is this dark fantasy world in a very Western style, but it's not the Westernized Japanese fantasy style, like there's Japanese fantasy that's Japanese in character and there's Japanese fantasy that is um, the Japanese take on western style fantasy which has itself become this kind of aesthetic genre unto, unto itself. I cannot speak to how Dark Souls relates to King's Field because I have not played King's Field and I don't, he, I always meant to look this up but I don't even know what genre of game it is. Um, But I think there's a few there's a few um, games and uh, other media too probably that have attempted to do that. But um, that in and of itself is interesting because uh, it grew out of the popularity of the game Wizardry in Japan, which sort of established this the fantasy genre, which then split off into JRPGs. Which became their own very consistent style, um, to the point where, you know, a Western developer could make a game that is recognisably a JRPG, despite the fact that, uh, that a Western developer, you know, it's not a Japanese developer. Um, and similarly, this kind of, like, Japanese take on Western fantasy thing, you know, kind of re record of Lodos War, or just any of the many, many descendants of that kind of um, thematic bloodline. Well, I mean, you could argue that this is very much that same kind of game, like, Dark, Dark Souls is a... I mean, it's third person instead of first person, but hey, you could play uh, Elder Scrolls in third person if you want to. The difference between third person and first person isn't very large or meaningful um, in this kind of game world, I don't think. There's a kind of, like, an immediacy um, to being in first person that you don't get in third person. But there's a claustrophobia you get in the third person that you don't necessarily get in first person, I think. Do I even have... Oh, I do. I've got a whole bunch of other spells I could be using. Uh, 
This is the way we all go out in the end, trapped in a run cycle against a rock. Or indeed poisoning me just because I missed with my soul arrow yet again. Hmm, that's fair. I really should find a way to emulate it or something. I wonder if you could argue that um, Elden Ring is the new Kingsfield, because it really doesn't seem very um, GRR Martin-y to me, personally. Um, I mean, we don't know anything about the narrative, but that guy does very kind of like specific kind of truth-based, like, we know what's happening in different places at different times, and it's all about the actions of human people and their motivations and their obsessions and all of these different um, very character-based factors, whereas Dark Souls, or, I mean, uh, from Soft's output generally has this much more weird existential vibe where sometimes people aren't really even people, they're more like existential concepts and sometimes there's really no truth to anything and in fact there being no objective truth to anything is a major part of the um, themes of um, Dark Souls specifically because the way that this uh, that this narrative plays with concepts of, of myths and myth making and how myths are used for different purposes by different people at different times and the way they're established and the way they grow is really interesting and it's part of why this is a really special series. Nobody loves the sewer level. I don't think... It, it's almost mandatory. Every game has to have a sewer level. Um, or at least a nod to a sewer level. So there are these little holes you can fall down. You've got to be careful not to if you don't want to. This is where we fought the giant rat, so we know where we are now. Um, fun fact, I've played this game a ton over the years. I had not been cursed any time I'd played this game in like the last six or seven years. And then when I was playing the other day on my, uh, on my, my private secondary character, uh, on my first way through here I got cursed and died. And it was a fascinatingly revelatory moment. It was like, oh. Oh, this is what it's like for everybody else when they play Dark Souls. I'm not going to waste any magic on this thing. They have very low poise, but instead of falling over, they um, kind of splat into goo. But provided you keep hitting them, they can't actually attack you because their animations are so long that you just interrupt them every time. I mean, I was cursed on my first playthrough of the game, but after that I knew how to avoid it, and I simply I simply did not be cursed. Oh wait, that's the that's the same drop-down. I know there's a way to get down there without going down the drop-down, and I can never ever find it. Every time I come through these tunnels, there's like four tunnels here, but it feels really uh, maze-like. But um, I always end up having to go down one of these drop-downs, just because I can't find the fucking way. Is it- oh, is it here? Is this it? Nope, this is where we started. I was actually thinking earlier about curses. I was thinking about how... Kind of the curse, conceptually, is an interesting position, because... Even in fantasy stories that have really prescriptive, really uh, mechanical, really thoroughly designed and thought out and exacting magic systems, curses are kind of mysterious. Curse is kind of the word for big magic that operates on, on kind of different logic. Um, so I was thinking about the basilisks that we're probably about to fight right now. Oh, I should have become human. Um, I, I can go back and become human after I, uh, after I unlock the shortcut. So these are basilisks. Um, as is traditional in fantasy, a basilisk will turn you to stone if you let it. Fun fact about this really weird creature design. Those giant googly eyes are not its actual eyes, they're more like eye spots. Um, it actually has, on the model, you can't really see it here, but um, it's got a little snout that pokes between and it's got forward facing eyes on the end of its snout, uh, which are its real actual eyes.
The tight corridors are kind of yet another like method by which Dark Souls teaches you to play Dark Souls. Um, on your first time through any new area in a Dark Souls game, you're peeking round corners with your shield raised if you're doing it properly, and you are not running through spaces because there will be holes in the ground. Yeah, um, I thought I, I thought about that too. It makes sense as logic, like. Um, but yeah, they're horrible and everyone hates them. Also, these statues, uh, if you die from the fog that they create, um, you get cursed, which means you wake up with half of your hit points and um, you're stuck like that until you use one of a rare item or find a very specific NPC in a very specific place. But, fun fact, these statues, these are the statues of other players. Um, one of the many subtle multiplayer elements, it's not just the spirits. If someone dies in your orbit from being cursed, then uh, their, their body shows up as a, an ash statue in your game. But um, there is, I think, maybe the first Red Phantom invasion in the game in this area, which I do not want to miss out on. Because it's everybody's favourite um, murderer with a heart of gold, uh, Kirk the Knight of Thorns. So if you don't want to um, die of curse, you simply don't go in the fog. But um, back to the point I was making about curses. A very amusing thought that occurred to me is that, like, say that these creatures evolved naturally, which is unlikely, but say they did, um, and developed some kind of ability to use magic. Yeah, this is this is not where Kirk invades. Um, I like the idea that um, the curse isn't like supposed to turn you to stone. It's just supposed to kill you so they can eat you. And um, it just sort of becomes more and more refined through evolutionary pressure over time until they um, wind up killing everybody by the strength of the curse itself. Which, of course, turns you to stone, which means they then can't eat you. It's much more likely that they just eat the stone statues, or indeed that they just are here for other purposes and other reasons, and they don't need to eat anything at all because that's not really what they are or do. Oh, that one's a sneaky one. It's very satisfying to just kill these in one hit, which again is one of the benefits of the sorcerer. I should probably switch back to my soul arrows, actually. Well, there's never a point where you don't have uh, an elo song stuck in your head, though, is there? So this drop down... where does that drop down go? Is that the one that drops you right where Kirk spawns in? I think it is. Um, so I'm not going to drop down there because we'll end up down there in a minute anyway. I think it's... actually it's just down there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Kirk himself is an interesting character. He's um, what A lot of the characters in Dark Souls you only really learn about through... Maybe one NPC will mention them one time with some kind of cryptic hint as to, as to who they are and what they do. Um, and then there's a couple of items that might mention them uh, in their descriptions. I haven't looked at the item descriptions on this playthrough so far, it's just because I'm familiar with all of them, but I probably should do that at some point because, you know, the odder items usually have interesting little hints about things. Um, although, none of these. Unique weapons and rings usually have just little hints, you know? One of the special rings granted to the Four Knights of Gwyn. The wolf ring belongs to Artorius the Abysswalker. Artorius has an, has an unbendable will of steel and was unmatched with a greatsword. And that's kind of it. That's the information that you get on these people. You get like two or three little snippets like that. Um, and you kind of have to put them back together in your own mind. Which is why I think this game is just absolute catnip to the kinds of people who search out every little scrap of detail and decide that everything means every something and that everything they find out it must be literally true these kind of like four hour lore videos that you get on dark souls like i can understand why people make them but um as my regular soapbox has always been i think that that fundamentally misunderstands what the game is um and the way these stories are told and should be told and should be interacted with that is a dead end. Oh, there's only place. Okay, so there's only one place we can go now, which is the way up here. So.
so um yeah but occasionally there are clear direct narratives and um kirk is really interesting because you know you're making your way through this dungeon it's horrible it's difficult you're having a horrible time and then he invades you and he's wearing evil looking armor um covered in spikes and he tries to kill you and maybe you kill him maybe he kills you whatever but um he's actually uh one of the few recurring invaders he invades you three times over the course of the game i think um and um you're never told any of this but you know that he's invading you to steal humanity and that there are various kinds of people in this world who do that the main purpose of invasions is to take humanity from other people to make yourself stronger but um as you go you can learn about him and you can put stuff together this is where he attacks he he's spawns around this corner so i'll come back down here and he'll spawn in once i am human thanks to the humanity i picked off this rat because rats have humanity the enemies that drop humanity are actually kind of few and far between. You have to know which ones drop it if you want to farm it. Um, and these rats are actually one of the best early game humanity farming locations. As you can see. That was lucky timing. I think there's a rat in this box. <laughs> nope. Is there one in this one? Okay, there's definitely a box with a rat in around here somewhere. It can be a bit erratic to find them. But Okay, here's the shortcut. Um, and another slime. So, um, as you learn about uh, the Knight of Thorns, you can... The first time you kill him, he drops his uh, weapon, so you can learn a bit about him from that. Uh, but ultimately, what you, all you really know about him is that he's this kind of cruel knight who invades people to steal their humanity and wears this horrible barbed armour. And... Um, Actually, I might switch to. I might start using his sword because it's got a bleed effect, which is quite useful for sorcerers because we can't maintain um, a lot of um, high energy combat. So, after the third time you kill him, he dies. This is a consistent thing that um, NPCs you summon to help you out, or that um, you uh, that invade you as red phantoms, you can often find their corpses. Um, after certain points in the narrative, because all of the NPCs in this game have these weirdly woven narratives where you slowly uncover things about them, but you have to be at places at specific times, and you can accidentally advance the plot along without, like, coming and finding them. And if you, and if that's the case, then, um, can I level up? I cannot level up. Let's have a look at this guy. Deborah, wearing the... I think that's the leather armor chest piece or oh, that might be the warrior's chest piece and um, the rest of it is uh, the knight set sadly she has gone I like this guy as well that's a fellow sorcerer he's wearing the sorcerer armor set the bonfires as a sort of set of linchpins for reality that are frantically desperately trying to hold it together as reality itself slowly collapses because the life cycle of the universe has been prolonged too long through hubris is really neat. Um, this is again one of those things that's never outright stated but that you can put together through observations. You see phantoms all around because different worlds, different states of time, different places are blending together as reality itself breaks down. And as a part of that, um, you see, you know, other people. Sometimes they're really there, sometimes you just see their phantoms, but the ghosts of other players are much more strongly visible at bonfires. It both lends this kind of sense of camaraderie because one of the major themes in um, in Dark Souls is this kind of sense of this overbearing challenge and difficulty, but that no matter how hard it gets, there's always someone there to help you. And there's always another fucking rat. <laughs> I forgot how many of them there were in this area. Um, so yeah. Even in, even in the worst places at the worst times, even as your despair builds, someone is there. Someone is going to be there for you eventually. Someone will help you. We can reach out to each other across spaces and times. Um, and together we can overcome the odds, which I think is a very hopeful message in a very unhopeful place. As I said, oh, for fuck's sake. That one always gets me every single time I come through this zone. 
Um, I always get got by that one. Actually, it might be worth using heavy soul arrows on these because heavy soul arrows animation time means that it's not often um, like combat viable, but um, the damage output is much higher. So if they're going to be incredibly slow, I might as well wipe them out with this. Oh, I'm really glad you think so. It's part of my extensive and lengthy thoughts about this game, which, as I think I've mentioned on this stream, or on these streams rather, um, I'm not going to go into my like vast and enormous <laughs> hours and hours and hours of thoughts about the game. This is much more about just rambling as I casually play through it. However, um, I do talk about this stuff in great deal in my old Let's Play from a few years back um, on my YouTube channel. Oh, I'm poisoned again, as always. I actually bought way too much moss. I was expecting to have to use more of it. But as I was saying before, like this area is very small. It's actually only about five or six corridors and connecting to one another, and it's a lot more linear than it looks as well. Um, it's just that people get very intimidated by, um, you know, you you get uh, cursed once, and it's such a hassle to remove the curse, and then you just kind of are afraid of the depths forever, even though it's not a very difficult area, and it's quite sensibly laid out. So if I come over here, Kurt should attack. Or maybe it, it can't only be the first time you pass through the area. Red Spirits are supposed to, oh that was close, there we go. Is there any more, did I aggro? No. So he'll come around that corner in a second, I think. There he is. NPC phantoms are meant to mimic player behaviour much more accurately than most of the generic enemies. Um, which means they're generally tougher to fight. That was not what I meant to use. Although they are still susceptible to AI errors like getting stuck on scenery. Oh, that could have been a backstab, but my timing was a bit off. There we go. So, um, because they are programmed to behave more like players, they are... They do a lot more dodging, and they are better at dodging, which means that it's more difficult to fight them as a sorcerer. That won't be a problem later in the game, because with Crystal Soul Spear and a decent intelligence score, you can kill any NPC Phantom in the game in one hit, so you just spam it until you do hit them. <laughs> but yeah, um, the corollary to the uh, point I was making about Dark Souls as hope in a hopeless place is that even if you even if you don't find anyone to help you with the fight, there is still a sense that other people are around you and at least facing the same challenges. Even if even if no one is able to help you win your fight against whatever horrible beast you're you're fighting, you can still see someone else there. Um, you can still see that someone else is fighting the same challenges, attempting to overcome the same difficulties, and someone else might be just as frustrated as you are. Seeing other players, um, like ghostly phantoms, is live, I believe. Um, there was a very amusing one I saw earlier, actually, where I was backtracking through a boss arena, <laughs> and I saw someone get absolutely slammed to the ground, um, as if they'd been hit in the chest by some kind of mighty force. And I was like, yeah, I know, I know how it feels, that happened to me earlier. Okay, how are my attunement slots? Is there anything I- do I have any better spells yet? I do not. Um, it won't be until Sen's Fortress that I can get the next, like, tier of spells. So I'd like to have, um, like, th more intelligence by then. As you can see exactly how much of an increase in damage that made, because I killed him earlier and it did 86? 96 damage or something, and now it's 110. So those two points of intelligence have directly increased the amount of damage I did, which is how it works. <laughs> Um, as anyone who's played a video game might well know. Oh, I'm just going to use heavies on these. I don't actually need to... I don't need to kill this. I can just leave. I can just... Like, I can ollie outie. Bye. Like, you guys suck to fight. I'm just going. Do need to kill the rats, though. But yeah, I, I agree. I do think it's endearing the way they're like... It, you know, it's a fair cop, Gov. <laughs> I will I will receive my um, kidney removal now. And you see, I can kill these in one hit now that I've upgraded it. So I'm actually going to come through here. This is where we need to go next, but I'm going to come through here to just... Hi, Shabai. Happy to you. I'm Don on the 
serves me now. I'm just a rat, a peddler of sorts. I adore trinkets and oddities, so I trade for them. Observe, the only Welshman in all of Lordran. Um, Domhnall of Zena is great. He's one of these um, characters that you're not supposed to read too much into. He just kind of chills down here. He's just a wandering merchant who set up shop in a sewer and is presumably bilking the rats for everything they're worth. And it looks like that has made it through the gap. I did not know they could do that. I thought they were stuck on the other side of that iron bar. So I'll just um, save both myself and him. But um, one of the fun facts about him is that the helmet of his armour set is actually based on a real piece of armour. I believe it's one of the helmets of Henry VIII. Um, from, I want to say, the 15th century, but don't quote me on that. Oh yes, I forgot he moves to the Firelink. Um, it's not actually a bridge, it's an aqueduct, but yes. Not to be a pedant or anything. Hmm. I'm afraid I don't see anything here. Uh, excuse me? Hmm. I'm afraid I don't see anything. Oh yeah, he just doesn't want to buy anything, because it's almost a running joke in this game that none of the merchants will buy anything from you. Um, I do need to get the bottomless box at some point. But yeah, so... He's just kind of here. <laughs> and he's not interested in explaining himself to you in any way. So, it's going to be time for one of the most beloved bosses in- this is a There are certain memes in Dark Souls 1 that people just love to make the same joke over and over. And um, fatty and tight spot here is very common because you- it looks like you should be able to fit through there, but you can't. Um, it's impossible. There's nothing over there. It's not like intended traversable terrain. Um, people love to put tight spot or fatty in uh, spaces that look like you should be able to fit in but can't. Um, one of the delights about Dark Souls is that the messages you leave for other players, you have to um, assemble out of uh, little pre-made phrases. You can actually get quite clever with it. There's a lot of extremely crass jokes about amazing chest ahead in front of female characters and so on, or um, whenever there's a corpse slumped over a railing, the classic uh, tri-finger butthole. Um, which is tri-finger, comma, butt, comma, hole. In case you're wondering, there is no butthole phrase. So it's often actually a bad idea to summon people in to help you with this fight. Um, I think... I thought Soler's summon sign was around here somewhere, but apparently not. Oh, ah, here it is. It's actually a really bad idea to summon two NPC phantoms, because this boss has a high health pool, and as I've mentioned previously, when you summon phantoms, the damage and health of uh, the boss is increased because having a second or third body to help you massively decreases the difficulty. But this boss's health pool is really high to begin with. Oh, there we go. Is really high to begin with. Um, however, the benefit when you are a sorcerer outweighs the risks because you can just blast away from a safe distance. But yeah, people love this boss because it's such a weird design. Oh, by the way, welcome to both of the new followers, if they're still watching. Um, I'm really bad at remembering to say that when I get the message blue. So here we have the gaping dragon. Is it a dragon? Who knows? It's got six legs. That's not typically uh, part of the taxonomy of dragons. It's not especially difficult to fight, generally. Um, people think it's a di more difficult fight than it is, but it has really consistent animations that are very easy to keep track of. Um, and it has these two different modes. It has its sort of like torso up and torso down. And um, the animations, when it switches between the two, are nice and long, giving you lots of time to wail on it. Uh, it even has um, a particularly vulnerable uh, spot, which many bosses in the game do. But if you strike it on its nose enough, you can actually get a, a like massive damage increase bonus animation thing. 
It's like a repost, but for when you've broken an enemy's poise rather than for when you've um, parried them. So again, as I've said many times, Sorcerer is just easy mode. Just blast away, it's fine. So long. Yeah, that is kind of what I've been saying almost, is that Dark Souls teaches you how to play Dark Souls because it requires very specific things from you. And if you know what the designer wants from you, it's not as anywhere near as difficult as people make it seem or, or think of it. But um yeah. They're just there are there are ways and means and tricks to it. The Gaping Dragon itself is interesting because it's referred to as a dragon rather than a drake, which implies that it is an actual dragon. However, it's, you know, its physiology is utterly unlike other dragons. But that said, people don't seem to comment on this very much when they're doing these extensive lore um, breakdowns, which I can't stand <laughs> for the most part. Like the breakdowns that like talk about, oh, this is the information that we know. Those are fine. I like those plenty. Um, the law breakdowns that are um, these like highly interpretive things that are then stating, well, we know this as fact, you know, this this item says that this person said this thing about this other person, therefore we know that that is true about that other person, and it's not. All we know is that someone said that that person said that they said it, you know? Um, which again ties into the nature of myth and divinity and what those things mean and what they can mean and how they can be used. It's been degenerated, but not by darkness. This is actually a point I was about to get to. Um, first off, I was going to point out that dragons themselves have very variable form factors. Um, both uh, Calamit, the um, immortal dragon of the Ash Lake. Wow, that's a fit. I'm going to wear that to a LARP next year. Um, anyway, so... Yes, I mean, that is literally it. It is... Um, but it's, uh, I think the thing about Dark Souls is it's more that your obsessions change your form and your whatever it is that's corrupted you changes you in the way that makes sense for that to happen to you. But also that's a very slow process, taking eons. Um, what am I doing? Oh yeah, leveling up. I do not like odd numbers. I'd really like to get another attunement slot so I can um, have a few more spells going. I've got just enough souls that I want to tip it over and level up again in case I die and lose them all. But yeah, so uh, dragons themselves are quite variable in form. Um, uh, the black dragon Calamite, um, the immortal dragon, the gaping dragon, and Seath the Scaleless um, all have very different bodies. They're very different sizes. Um, Seath has three tentacles instead of legs, so... It's not unreasonable to assume that this dragon just looked partly like that. The, gi the gigantic ribcage and the sort of like difference between body size and head size um, are obviously corruptions due to greed and the obsession of consumption, but um, I think it could easily have just been a six-legged dragon. The only consistent thing about dragons really is their heads, which we will see a lot later in Anor Londo when we actually mount Olympus and breach the realm of the gods. I wasn't using mount as in mount as in the title of a mountain as a verb there. I meant mount as in like mounting a horse. I just forgot that the proper term is Mount Olympus. Well, I mean like, you know, goals, right? But um yeah, so that was my point about dragons, but my my other point is that um one of the things about the nature of reality in Dark Souls is, is that it's sort of formed by belief and myth. Um, I had this whole theory way back in the day. Oh, I still haven't remembered to upgrade to the point where I can equip a bow. Oh well. <laughs> I'll just aggro this guy and then climb out of the way. This guy's really easy to bait off the edge. He should just drop off the edge trying to hit me. Um, or I could just explode him. Height is an advantage in these games, usually, if you have indirect attacks. Uh, 
Well, yes, but Miyazaki has also said that all of the information in the work itself is supposed to be interpreted by the players, and they're supposed to come up with their own explanations and concepts for things. Oh, fantastic. The three damage from me landing on his head killed him. That's very rare that you get that to... <laughs> you managed to make that happen. Um... Well, yeah, that's exactly what um, I mean. Like, uh, Miyazaki himself is on record saying, like, you know, we didn't write these things with a consistent story in mind. We, writ we wrote lots of little bits of interesting detail that players would then create their own story out of. These guys are exceptionally easy to backstab, but uh, they're also very dangerous. You can fully block their attack without much difficulty. Um, but the knockback off it is really risky. One of the reasons they're actually easy to backstab, a lot easier than most enemies, is that um, you can actually you can actually um, strafe around them faster than they than they can uh, rotate to face you, which I think they're the only in enemy in the game that's true of, um, or at least the only backstabable enemy. Yeah, well, that's exactly how the um, the drakes are described. Drakes are described as being a consistent, like, taxonomic class unto themselves, consisting of the degenerated descendant of the everlasting dragons. Um, I personally believe that, like, there's a lot of this stuff about what is and is not primordial and what it might mean. Um, I think that the everlasting them dra dragons themselves became susceptible to things like death after the emergence of disparity, because the cosmology of the universe is that first there was nothing. There was stasis, and in the stasis there were dragons and trees, and they just sat there in stasis forever, because that's what stasis means, because without um, any kind of conception as to the difference between things, you can't differentiate between things, and therefore there is no things. Now, around us somewhere, there is a blow dart gunner who are who is one of the most frustrating enemies in this section. These guys are re relatively easy to parry. But um, I'd really like to switch to a parrying weapon, actually. Um, or a, uh, a crit weapon, rather. There it is, the toxic. I hate that guy so much. So the, um, the blowgunners in this area, which is Blight Town, which is the most frustrating area in the game for most people, uh, and I don't particularly like it myself, it's full of these pretty tough, fast, aggressive mutant guys. Um, but it is also, at certain points, infested with um, less mutated blow dart gunners. And uh, if they hit you basically with one hit, you will be inflicted with toxic, which is like poison, but much more much more dangerous. Um, and you need blooming moss to cure it, of which I only have one right now. Yeah, it's just that um, blooming purple moss is more expensive, and I don't want to grind up souls to to spend on it. Fortunately, the spider shield provides complete uh, block to all poison or to and toxic. What I normally do is I've normally remembered to put some points in dexterity by this point and I just snipe these guys from behind things where I can hit them and they can't hit me. As you can see, look at him go. He's having a whale of a time. So what I need to do is go kill him without being killed by uh, one of those mutants. So I'll lure that back into this hut, I guess, and fight them here. And of course there's two of them. So the real danger with those mutants is that they have a grab attack. Grab attacks are really dangerous in Dark Souls because they will bypass um, a shield block and tend to do a ton of damage, which is risky for a sorcerer. They're also, um, oh, they also often have inconsistent hitboxes. So, yeah, I think... I might want to go take my weapons to Andre and upgrade a little bit, actually. But one of the real problems with the depths, I think, one of the reasons... I say the problems, one of the difficulties with the depths and one of the reasons it's a real grueling trek is that, um... It's difficult to get back out again. Um, especially once you're up one bonfire deeper than this. It's very difficult to get back out, uh, which means that you can't visit all your various services. So, I think what I'm going to do... 
Wait, hang on. Did he not drop his sword? Maybe he only drops it on the next instance. That's a shame. Um... Yeah, as a sorcerer, relying on crit damage in melee is probably better, so I might just go upgrade that dagger. So if I'm going to do that, what I need to do is fight my way back out. <laughs> uh, go to the blacksmith, and then um, remember not to use a, a bonfire between here and there so that I can homeward bone back down to this point and then head on from here. That might take a little while. I'm going to sprint it and see if I can manage it. Oh, great, we're stuck in each other's hitboxes. Reblog if you would get stuck in each other's hitboxes with a mutual, or however that fucking meme goes. Oh, I see it's difficult to get back out. It is very difficult to get it back out from the next stage. What I've usually done traditionally is um, upgrade my weapons and everything before I come down here, um, but this is not a very like strictly planned playthrough. Guys respawn? No, they don't. So, uh, and then bring the weapon smith box with me so that I can use that to man that guy's move fast. Ah, okay, fair enough. I have traditionally gotten pretty lucky with drops. Um, on my very first, like, serious playthrough of this game, the first Black Knight in um, the Undead Burg uh, actually dropped the Black Knight sword, and at that point. <laughs> Uh, my friend told me that it was uh, a really rare drop and a very good weapon, and I was like, well, well that's my uh, entire plan all set then, isn't it? And from that point forwards, my entire goal of, in the game was to put enough points in strength that I could equip it. At which point it became my main weapon for the entire rest of the game. Which meant I didn't really engage with the gear aspect of the game at all, which is a shame, because it's kind of weird. It's very idiosyncratic, which is, is just true of this game across the board. Um, you don't have this kind of... you don't have the loot treadmill that most games have. Most weapons there's only one of, um, and weapons that drop tend to be quite rare um, and fairly generic. You know, it's not like you find... it's not like you kill a new goblin and it's got a plus five and you're like, oh, I only had a plus four before. What a good upgrade. Um, which almost all RPGs fall prey to, even RPGs that aren't concerned with a, uh, like an ARPG loot treadmill, you know, like the egregious things like um, Diablo, tend to have some aspect of it. Um, whereas in Dark Souls, you kind of eventually find something you like and then stick with it. You probably only use three or four weapons seriously throughout a run. Please, no, no, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in your product, sir. No, please, I just, I'd like to leave now. Um, I don't have any interest in fire or indeed in sharp pieces of metal being put into my body. I'm sure that you will find um, many customers for your startup, and I wish you the best of luck. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to going to have to say no. I've never had the energy to um, commit to. Uh, re-rolling essentially until I get the drop I want. It just seems way more tedious than perhaps it is. At least before you have lots of humanity, which having um, liquid humanity in your pool boosts your ability to find items. But yeah, so um, most of the weapons are unique and only available in one specific location, and many of them have different movesets to one, one another, and it it really isn't about the stats your weapon has. Um, in Souls, it's absolutely about the um, uh, the move set re rather than the um, the thing. Here's the Moss Merchant. So we're nearly back at Firelink Shrine. So actually, yeah, if I go to Firelink Shrine, I then go up in the lift, and then it's across the road to Andre, and then we can buy the Weapon Smith Box, and we'll be able to do basic upgrades to our weapons as we go, which I think is probably the most viable option here. Provided I don't forget that this guy's up here. Why am I using a sword? I'm a wizard. Actually, one of the things that they um, added to the later Souls games is like dual purpose weapons that are both uh, casting catalysts and melee weapons. You can bop people with your with your with your um, magic staff if you want, but it only has one attack, unlike the like three or four different attack animations that you get with other weapons, and it can't backstab or anything.
So once you know your way around, Dark Souls is not that difficult to traverse. Did we buy stuff from him? We did, didn't we? Poor young girl sent oh, down into a tomb. What a terrible mission she is burdened with. Oh yeah, so I was mentioning that Oh hello. Myself. I don't care. Um I was mentioning that um we don't need oral decoy, we can't afford the rest of these. I would like great heavy soul arrow, but I don't have eight thousand souls. I was mentioning these sort of weird passive storylines that play out in the background while you're running around doing stuff. Um, this is true for various NPCs that you meet, not just the ones who come back here to Firelink Shrine, but um Well, I see you made it out. Yeah, I, I made it out safely too. I have my Pyromancy of the Great Swarm, so I can use companions with a bit of care. Oh yeah. By the way, uh, I can share the spells with you. I think you have a knack for it. All you need are the materials. I'd be pleased to help you. Ah, and, unless you find the magic unsafe. Uh. Oh really? Well, that's a shame. But it, uh, it's your choice. I'm on the fringe. Yeah, I know. I, I'm dead or not, that's who I am. I only wish that, that, that I could have repaid you somehow. So that was a misclick. I actually meant to say no, because he's not asking, do you want me to teach you pyromancy? It's, do you find pyromancy distasteful? <laughs> it oh, was an there. accident. I'm pleased to see you safe. Oh, and uh, if by chance you've had a change of heart, I'll be pleased to assist you by sharing my spell. The fact that it flips between these two because this time you need to say yes. Yeah, wonderful. I'm sure that you know, they'll be of some use, some assistance. Here, first take this. I love his gentle insecurity as well. He's like, oh, normally I don't get stuck in a barrel in a sewer ready to be chopped up for meat by um, horrible giant butcher women. Like, normally my pyromancy does me fine. Like, bro, bro, how did you get stuck? You got barreled. A flame from the great swamp. Now you're a fully fledged pyromancer. Why let's get started right now. I love Lawrence just very much. He's one of my favourite characters in the game because he has exactly the energy of like a nerdy hobbyist who you've met in a pub in Wiltshire. And it's delightful. He's just so happy to talk about this this thing that's interesting and fascinates him. But that's maybe seen as slightly unsavory. It's it's very cute. Pyromancy is the art of casting fire. Produce flame, then channel it. Just as our ancestors did. The pyromancer must be in tune with nature herself. My home, the Great Swamp, is an abundance store of nature. You will understand one day. It only takes time. Like he's the kind of guy who you just know is gonna say, like Oh yeah, well the fascinating thing about the local history is actually that we didn't actually have witch burnings until 1562 and so on and so on and so on. Like, he's delightful. So he sells pyromancy and pyromancy accessories. <laughs> um, as I was saying previously, um, pyromancy doesn't really scale with stats in this game. So most melee characters will pick up some pyromancy as a backup. Uh, But um, because it's useful to have a little ranged attack that you can switch to easily, and it's weightless as well. I believe the pyromancy flame is weightless, so you can have it in your second melee slot and not uh, have it um, boost your your uh, weight percentage. Oh, hello! My guests have finally arrived. I will be departing with them shortly, so I'm afraid I will be saying goodbye soon. It was a pleasure. This guy sucks ass for reasons that we'll talk about when we do uh, the Tomb of Giants. Oh, hello. Miracles, I presume? Yes, I know. Everyone talks so fucking I slowly in this world. I don't care. I don't care about faith. Sorry? Beg your pardon? I see, okay. You are undead as well. We've no time to fraternize. I have my mission and you no doubt have yours. We must not let this curse overcome us. Did I not explain the urgency of our tasks? Or are you so uncouth as to lack such judgment? By the looks of you, I should think not. 
So this is one of these odd little passive storylines. Um, as I said before, you kind of have to stumble into them at the right moments. You have to, you know, you have to find Siegmeier wherever he is and talk to him at the right time. And then you have to find him at the next point at the right time. And then you have to be backtracking through the Great Swamp, even though you have literally no reason to, unless you happen to know that there's a bonus area there that you haven't already done. Um, and then you stumble across him there and then you find him somewhere else. But um, <clears throat> some of these plot lines are advanced by general event events that will happen as you progress through the game and some of them are, are progressed by you doing specific things for example buying all of a how, how did i miss this this is the most important treasure in uh the entire undead parish that's astonishing um so i'll just mention now because it'll come up later this statue is repeated a few places throughout the game um but i think this is this is something i talk about um on my in uh, at length in my in my proper let's play but the thing about um this place is that you have to bear in mind that this is not a place that necessarily knows about the gods as people who exist and do stuff in the world um there's a huge difference between the architecture of the undead parish which is much more recent than the architecture of uh sen's fortress which is over there and which we will be going to much later Ah, oh, okay. Pointless to parry when you have your, your sorcery casting catalyst out. Um, anyway, but this implies a, a, an interesting relationship, um, because you have to bear in mind that this is at the end of the universe. A vast, vast amount of time has passed, and, um, you know, time is blurring itself as everything else contracts back to its originating point. So, you know, the age of gods passed long ago, and human civilizations have risen and fallen in the gap since. Um, so the reason why I think that that statue in particular is interesting is because it is in the Undead Parish, which is one of the more recent parts. I must not rest at that bonfire. That was, that was really close. Um, but um, that is the only place in the game where we actually see a devotional like place of worship for the various gods of this setting. So much of what happens is, you know, to do with the doings of these gods and what they get up to, and yet um, we learn very little about them, and very little about the way they interacted with the humans that worshipped them. Ah, why, that's a fine ember you have there. I could smith some mighty weapons with one of those. Why not lend it to me? I think Andre is the only NPC in the game who has mouth animations when he talks. Everybody else just stares at you. So I actually want to buy the Weaponsmith box and the Armorsmith box, which I tragically can't afford. Well, fortunately... Well, actually, I'm not going to upgrade my armor. Who gives a shit about armor? It's fine. <laughs> so instead, I'm just going to upgrade weapons. So we've given him the two embers that we found. Um, yeah, you're right, actually. This is also very much a man you would meet in a pub in Wiltshire. Um, this is very much the kind of, like silver-haired, silver-earringed, um, leather jerkin-wearing type. Uh, what am I doing? I'm leveling something up. I don't have titanite shards, but I can buy a couple, but is that even worth it? I can buy one. Not quite afford two. I'm just, I'm just gonna put another... No, I'm not. I'm going to upgrade the dagger and use the dagger. I'm going to switch back to it. Since I'm relying on crit damage anyway, and just flailing furiously won't help me as a wizard. So I got the armor smith box, which is what we really wanted, and it's time to head back to the horrible place. Incidentally, uh, most of the places we find embers throughout the game, they are held by people who look identical to him. Um... To be honest, this is probably a structural thing of like just reusing assets, because one of the other things about the Souls games is that they... FromSoft like to make changes halfway through, and a lot of sudden changes right at the end of the development, where they, they sort of remix the entire game and reshuffle it. Which is possibly one of the reasons why randomizer mods are so, for, so popular for this game, is because they actually work decently, because the game itself has been reshuffled. 
Um, but it's very notable that there are a few different places in Dark Souls 1 that were sort of unfinished and um, a few different aspects of it where it's kind of like they just crammed in whatever they could get at the last minute. But um, I was talking about sort of... I was talking about religion. So the reason why that statue and that place is important is it has the, it's the only sort of place of implied actual worship. Um, it's literally called the Undead Parish. It's modelled on a church. It is a place where the undead worshipped. What were the undead doing here? We don't know. What was that guy doing? We also don't know. And neither did he, which is why he has fallen to his death. But um, one of the important aspects of it is it has those really detailed um, bar-reliefs on the walls, which are relatively unusual um, throughout the game as well. Um, there's this kind of like aspirational aspect, this kind of worshipful aspect to um, images of what are very clearly men, beasts, and crops. So you can easily infer that this is a kind of like... Did I get hit by... <sighs> Wait, I'm poisoned. No, these guys just do poison because they're very filthy boys. The fact that they drop um, dung pies when you kill them infuriates me. It's just gross. I do not wish to have that. Thank you very much. But yeah, so... Um, it's very kind of like vaguely Christian-y mixed with um, sort of like Um, various, like, ancient Middle Eastern cultures, um, kind of art and artistry. Which is pretty common for this kind of, it's a very common sort of trope for this kind of, uh, setting. But, it also, where the fuck? He's over there. Maybe I should just run over and kill him, him before I kill these guys. I like that these are smart enough to know that they should break the things that are uh, stopping them from killing me. Which is good for them and bad for me. I personally believe these are undead just like the hollows elsewhere, except that unlike, um, unlike hollows, uh, these guys have sort of become degenerated into weird sewer mutants, which I think we can all identify with. And... Um, yeah, this whole zone is really difficult because they aggro from quite far away. They will occasionally just throw themselves into the void for you, which is very uh, convenient and very polite of them. Can I just blast that guy with a spell? Oh, I'm toxic. Getting hit with toxic is really difficult because I don't have the healing item that repairs it anymore, since I didn't pick any up from the uh, merchant that sells it, because it's expensive and I don't have souls. Which means I'm going to have to rely on trying to out-heal the damage. Toxic does a lot more damage than poison does. That was not a healing item. I'll probably die of this. Fortunately, the blowpipers don't respawn. They are one of the non-respawning enemies in the game, which means that if you kill them, they're gone. So I should be able to get through this without getting toxic this time. Yeah, it ain't the first time. I'm not on my best form today, as I have been incredibly ill all day. I actually went to back to bed for an hour and a half before before streaming, just because I was not doing great. <sighs> I have a wide variety of horrible symptoms that may or may not be COVID-related, uh, that I'm having trouble getting my doctors to take seriously in any way. Um, which sucks. It sucks ass. I feel like these mutants are disappointed about a lot of things, you know? The fact that they live in a sewer. In fact, they don't even live in a sewer, they live in the sub-sewer. Because, um, you know, this this whole world has kind of like the doings of the gods at the top, and then the doings of the people upon whose uh, heads the filth of the gods trickles down. And then, of course, there's the sewer people who live in the sewer, and um, the filth of everybody above them trickles down onto them. And then there's the sub-sewer people, who are incredibly fucked up. <laughs> Case in point, this lad. That was risky. I really, really wish I had the bandit dagger. The crit damage on it is so great. 
I'm tempted to go try and farm one up in between streams, actually. And if I'm lucky, that might kick him off the edge. Bye! It's so nice to have that happen to other people sometimes. Can I hit these guys with heavy? I probably can, actually. That might knock them half. No, they're, they just have huge health pools. Light town, light town. It's a hell of a place. There's monsters there that will spit in your face. So the main difficulty with fighting these guys is that they just have a huge health pool. Um, even their big melee attacks aren't usually enough to break the break the stability of um, even like an ordinary shield like the spider shield, which does not have especially high stability. The main benefit of the spider shield is that complete poison block, but um, yeah. So there is going to continue to be a lot of fisting uh, in this stream. This is a very fisty area of the game. There's these guys, there's the uh, other sewer mutants. There's just a lot of it around, really. I wonder if perhaps there's some kind of further meaning to it. No, there absolutely isn't. I'm just absolutely bullying this fucker. It's the death of a thousand anus stabs. Anyway, fisting completed. Time to go find someone else to brutally murder. So if I am correct about the guy, he shouldn't be there anymore and we should be alright. These guys are pretty easy to parry, but they're so fast and dangerous that I uh, prefer to only do that if there's only one of them around. And if I have enough stamina. One of the um, curious things, actually, I've noticed is that a lot of people um, early on try to fish for backstabs by constantly circling. But the actual real trick to um, getting lots of nice, efficient backstabs is to fuck off. You can just do this forever, it's great. <laughs> or that guy might uh, kill you. Anyway, um, the thing, the actual trick to fishing for backstabs is to provoke your opponent to get stuck in a animation. Um, because everybody can circle as fast as you can strafe around them, which means that you can never actually get behind them to make the um, hitbox line up, because there's a very specific hitbox behind someone that allows you to backstab them. That guy's trying to get ahead in life. So because of that, um, it means that if you constantly circle, you'll just spin around each other in a circle forever. Um, the real trick is to immediately start moving the moment you see your opponent go into an animation, because then um, once an animation starts, they're locked into it and they can't continue to rotate. Backstabs in Dark Souls 2 was really strange. Can I hit him with spells? Yes, I can. Nobody, nobody, shh, everybody be really quiet. Nobody, nobody say anything. Nobody make any noise. Get fucked. <laughs> so now that we've cleared out this zone, we can grab the one item that is down here, which I think is a night soul, maybe. The weird, the weird thing about the, do uh, the backstabs in Dark Souls 2 is that they kind of like... I think they did not actually... You had to hold the button down throughout the entire animation, or at least through the first part of the animation, otherwise the animation would start and then they'd sort of like wiggle out of it. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. I do have a lot of stuff to say about um, the kind of like... size of people and mythic importance and what it means that some people are giants and some people aren't, and all of this other stuff, but and like how people become changed by stuff over time. But that's probably gonna have to wait for next time because I, as I have said, I'm not a hundred percent focused today. Um, blame whichever of the like five horrible diseases I might have. Oh, 
Oh hey, he didn't die. I consign you to this purgatory. A fate worse than death. It's all you deserve. This is a really, really, like, the tourism industry in Blighttown is absolutely struggling. It is a, um, really unfriendly place, you know. It's like Hackney. Which is a very fun, funny joke if you're from London. Um, so I think there's three more sewer mutants over here. Oh, it was easy to get it at different angles, but I, I sort of... It was this sort of weird, slow, gooshy animation that took a couple seconds to sort of lock in for me. I don't know whether that was a quirk of the game or if I was doing something different. I don't know. One of the fun things about Blighttown is that... Um, as I have said before, the pathing AI in Dark Souls is really good. People don't give it enough credit. Um, it's very difficult to program an AI to path through an area correctly, and some of the areas in Dark Souls are ridiculously convoluted, as you can see. All of all of that is climbable and walkable and traversable. Um, and... Um, the fuck was I talking about? Uh, Look, I lived in London for most of my life. I know I know how London be. Um, but also Hackney is my generic nasty bit of London to name, so it might be quite nice there. It's been a very long time. Oh, okay, my spells are misaligning. When you fire a spell straight up or down, sometimes it just fizzles right into the ceiling and doesn't actually go where you wanted it to. Oh, here's another fun quirk about Dark Souls. Um, so... As you saw, that spell didn't impact on that guy. That's because... Okay, well, that that spell blasted on this one, but the previous one. <laughs> um, if someone's on a ladder, you can hit them with spells. If someone is in the animation state of going from being climbing the ladder to being on top of the ladder at the top, they... Ouch. Um, oh no, where did the one with the... Did he go down the side? I want my item. <laughs> I'm never going to get that. God damn it. Well, it's probably only a dung pie anyway. Um, but yeah, so, uh, yeah. The animation state is basically that um, they are uninteractable. It's the same as when you get a backstab. Blooming moss, that's perfect. We'll need lots of that. Hidden path ahead, I think that's a lie. People, there's a lot of places in the game people imply that you can get to stuff because there's a lot of places in the game where it looks like you can reach further places. And there are so many odd little nooks and crannies that are reachable in Dark Souls that often it seems reasonable and you, and um, it's very easy to fall for these these devious message levers. So these two bridges, this and the one I crossed a little while ago, are the only moving bridges in the game. It is once again um, an example of these mechanics that they put in very briefly. Um, just to keep you on your toes. Much like a dog that breathes fire. And indeed also keep you on your toes. Talking about Hackney, talking about Hackney's video games, am I right? That was absolutely on purpose, I meant for that thing to jump off after me. That's not true. <laughs> that was a happy accident. Um, so if I time this right, I should be able to drop onto that item nice and neatly. There we go. As you can see, lots of people have died around here. Those separating bloodstains are the last vestiges of other players. Which can be quite useful to see how they died. Um, that person got hit by something and just died from the damage. Tragically, you can't cancel out of a spellcasting animation. This is less of a problem when you have Soul Arrow equipped and more of a problem when you have one of your four casts of Soul Spear. Um, which you were saving for a tough enemy. Have I got every item here? Uh, there's the one that guy dropped, which is stuck. Uh, I think that's everything. What the fuck was I talking about before any of this? There was the animation states, there was, uh, something. Oh, um, the AI. So I actually think the AI is very well coded because it's actually able to interact with these spaces sensibly and reason reasonably. And how do I get over there? Oh, I need to find my way up. I'm on a lower level than the uh, this big archway buttress thing, which is what we will need to cross to the second half of Blight Town. So there's a ladder here somewhere. 
as you go through this area, you will occasionally just receive souls. That's because enemies have tried to path to you and have fallen the fuck off cliffs. The thing is, most games would code the AI so that they are they won't path into other areas at all. But it's so robustly coded in Dark Souls that they are not only capable of going to other areas and understanding what is and is not traversable terrain and correctly pathing through that terrain that they don't even get stuck on stuff very often. One in five will fall off like an idiot and um, the other four will reach you and then eat your face. Where the hell is the stepladder? There's a ladder here somewhere that will let me get back up. Um, it doesn't help that the ladders look exactly the same as all of the other material in this area. Everything is made out of shitty sticks. Can I get across from up here, maybe? Light Town is one of the only areas of the game that is not indelibly stamped on my memory because it actually is a labyrinth, unlike uh, the depths. Which is just a, just a fun little, you know, teaser trailer of um, how complicated the spaces in this game can get. Anyway, I'm going to commit to being here at this point. Because if I rest at this bonfire, um, there's no easy way out. So from this point, we won't be going back up to the surface until we've gone through this area, the swamp down there, and the boss at the end of the swamp, and then we eventually have to fight our way back up out again. Um, but this does continue the trend in Dark Souls of showing you other areas of the game from the areas you can reach. There's a very clear understanding of the ways in which these different zones connect together um, spatially and um, logistically. One of the fun things to do here is actually if you have put those two points in dexterity and can use a longbow, you can very easily ping um, enemies from quite far away to aggro them and then watch delighted as they either successfully work their way across the entire area, which they often do, um, or just for hint just absolutely fling themselves into the abyss, which is also quite funny. I was lucky, got my shield up in time. There's about 20 or 30 of these guys in the area, and they ver aggro very inconsistently from different spaces, so you do have to be very careful at all times that one of them will not drop on you. Because getting the drop on you is bad. I know this is kind of a hot take and that it's like, you know, sort of out of character for my channel that I would go that far, but I do actually think it's generally really bad to let an enemy drop on your head. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of dissent, you know, there's going to be call out posts, but um, no, I'm going to stand by it. Anyway, <laughs> that's this dipshit dealt with. Um, so I generally like to completely clear out areas so that I can get every single item. Um, I'm a weird obsessive like that, and that usually means killing every enemy. Including the ones who are hiding in pots to ambush you when you don't expect it. Because he's not, like... There's certain enemies you can't lock onto until they're sort of active, and he's one of them. He's just having a nice time. It's like those uh, steam baths people used to have in like the 60s, where you'd sit in a box and be steamed gently. For reasons that I don't understand. So can I... No, I still haven't put the points in dexterity. I'm a fool. I need to... Okay, my next... Everybody remind me. My next upgrades need to be to dexterity so that I can manipulate enemies. Because as I mentioned last stream, um, the bow in Dark Souls isn't really a damage dealing implement unless you're willing to um, do cheese strats that involve basically standing in a place for four or five solid minutes, um, which I'm not because I'm very impatient. Therefore, it's more of a tool for moving the AI around, either by aggroing them from a distance or by distracting them with noises, or various other tricks and trips. Uh, tricks and trips? That's not, that's not something anyone says. That's, that's, that ain't a phrase. Yeah, there were a lot of weird war effort Beano comics way back in the day. In fact, I can't shake the feeling that I went on a, like, lengthy mono... I'm having intense deja vu about running through Blight Town while talking about the history of the Beano comic in the UK. That's weird. That's peculiar. Maybe that was... Maybe I monologued to my flatmates about the history of the UK comics publishing industry 
while playing through Dark Souls 3. And there's a zone in Dark Souls 3 that's vaguely light towny, maybe? That has to be it, right? I didn't previously stream this game and talk about the Beano and the Dandy? Surely not. Oh, hey, that's fascinating. So that's a trap I've never seen before. I did not know that you could break that floor and fall through it. Uh, fascinating that I'm still discovering secrets about this game. He's just hanging out. He's just having a little wiggle. He's levitating through the force of his own will. But he's clearly having a good time. He's throwing his hands in the air. He's partying. It's great. It's fine. Don't, uh, don't question it. <laughs> Let's move on. So that's, um... Two horrible mutants consigned to permanent limbo now, then. <clears throat> now, it's definitely... How do I get that item? <clears throat> my voice is going because I have had COVID and now my lungs and throat don't work properly. Ah, here we go. It is very rare in this game that you can actually... Because of that good pathing, uh, it's very rare that you can actually trap NPCs. But it is quite satisfying, and it does render them harmless in a way that uh, is not otherwise viable. I think I can get another item here. Yep, there it is. So if I have enough equipment percentage, it's worth switching to the um, shadow set in this area, because the shadow set is light armor that has really high uh, poison resistance. Um, and there's a lot of things that poison you around here. So that takes me up to 6.9. Nice. And the Shadow Guard will take me up to 9.2. I might even be able to wear some boots. It's been a while since I wore boots. These are not boots. These are gloves. Do I have a useful hat? I do not. Um, I might as well wear the full Shadow set. And that's definitely less than 13, so I am fine. Oh, I know why I have more equipment load to play with. It's because I, I stopped using the double-handed sword, the, the, the long sword, and I started using uh, a knife, a pokey little dagger. So that's this tower cleared out. I don't think there's anything more on this side, except for whoever that guy I just heard smash a pot is. I can hear him running around. Where the fuck did you come from, my good dude? Are you the guy I consigned to the void? By the way, I just want to point out the absolute flex that I got the parry timing correct there, even though I couldn't see him. That, incidentally, is the grab attack I mentioned that you need to be very careful of. How do I, wait, how do I get back? <laughs> oh god. Uh, oh, there's a ladder. This is... No, I came down here before. So, one of the difficulties is that the jump in Dark Souls doesn't take you up very far. There's, you gain zero height when you leap. It's a forwards rolling leap type of, type of thing. So you um, uh, cannot go upwards by jumping. But there's a lot of places that have very narrow height differences. The kind of like the traditional knee-high wall that stops you going somewhere in a video game is present in Dark Souls. Uh, almost ubiquitously. So, oh, aha. Uh -huh. I'm not falling for your tricks this time, Mr. Blow Dart. Once he's spotted you and aggroed you, he can actually shoot you from way further back than he would normally do so. Um, also, it's worth mentioning, as I said before, the uh, benefit of... Um, you can you can abuse the benefit of certain animations preventing you from uh, being being tar uh, targetable. I have actually dodged attacks by initiating a backstab in the past, which is delightful. Um, it's very funny to watch an enormous spell orb pass through you as you sink your you know horrible little paring knife into someone's kidneys. So, having cleared out like roughly half the top area of Blight Town. Um, I think that's where I'm going to call it for today. My throat's getting very sore. So, thank you for coming with me on this horrible journey into the darkness of the soul and also the sewer system. 
Needs a bit of maintenance, but that's how it is. But that is going to be all from me for today. Come back in like two-ish days. I'm going to I'm gonna set up an actual schedule in the next couple of days. I haven't had one of those since I went on hiatus because of COVID. Um, but I'm just going to decide that I will actually have a, uh, a stream schedule again shortly. So watch out on Twitter for that. If you don't already follow my Twitter, go do that. Um, also go check out my YouTube, it's full of good stuff. And also thank you to my Patreon, I appreciate the support massively. Um, and finally, if you think anyone like might like my content, especially my in-depth YouTube Let's Plays, please let them know and like just share my stuff around. I really appreciate reblogs, retweets, um, word of mouth. I am really pleased with how my channels are growing and I would like to keep them that way. So, thank you so much for joining me. I will catch you again in a few days, assuming that I am not hospitalized for some horrible disease again. <laughs> Bye. Oh, I, I used to, I used to always do this at the end of a stream. Or at the end of an episode or whatever. Anyway, so that is all from me. Thank you so much and goodbye.